Can we start with a moment of prayer? Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, we come to you today and we're asking that you open our eyes, open our hearts to your truth and to your wisdom, Lord. May it not be my words that are spoken, but may it be your Holy Spirit describing a message for each and every heart that is in the room today. Make it unique for us, Lord. Speak into our lives, speak into our relationships as we listen to what you have for us. May your scripture scream truths and promises and love into our hearts. We pray this in no other name than Jesus Christ. Amen. Well... It's good to be with all of you here today. So if you've hung around me for a moment or two, you would know really quickly, I am not the athletic type, okay? I am not a sports person. Every try, time I try to do a sport, I fail miserably. I think that's why God put me in Southern California to grow up because sports for me meant skateboarding and rollerblading and all the other kind of skating and maybe a little surfing mixed in there. Um, but when I got to high school, I wanted one of those nifty, cool Letterman jackets. How many people have a Letterman jacket from high school in this room? I'm jealous of you, okay? I'm jealous of each and every one of you because you got that. Um, so I made the decision that I'm going to join a sport. Now, at that point in my life, I had lived my whole life not doing any sports, and so I needed to choose a sport carefully, one that did not need strategy, one that did not need skill set. And so I chose the sport running, long distance running. I was like, you just got to run? How hard could that be? Just get after it. Famous last words, right? Cross country was the sport that I chose. And my freshman year of high school, I suffered through that whole year. I, I, to my credit, I made it through this season. As much as I thought about every practice and every meet about quitting right there on the spot, I made it through one year of that season. Then the wonderful year, part of the year came, summer, where we didn't have to practice at all. And then fall came, and I got my transcript, and I saw that I was automatically enrolled right back in cross country. And so I had to go meet with the coach and have a difficult conversation because I decided it's just not for me. Kiss that Letterman jacket goodbye. It's not worth running five miles at practice and three and a half miles at the meets. Y'all who do that are talented. I'm sorry I said it wasn't a skill set. I'm sorry that I said you didn't need strategy because you do because I can't do it on my own, okay? <laughs> I'm just not wired that way. Now, that whole year, part of the reason I was able to go the whole semester on that team was because of the coach. And what does a coach do? They speak words into your life. The coaches aren't in the game playing the game. They're talking to you. They're encouraging you. They're informing you. They're showing how you could be a better athlete if you would just do this, this, and this. They're helping you feel seen. And coach of the cross-country team did that well. See, I think that's one of the main reasons I stayed on that team for that whole year. So I went to his office and I told him, Coach, I enjoyed the last year to the best of my ability. If I was going to say I enjoyed running, I think this is the best case scenario, but I hate running. <laughs> okay? And I'm just going to have to say, I am not your guy. I'm going to resign from the team. And I hope the team does well this year. And the coach turned to me. And he got really loud, and he said, get out of my office. You are a quitter, and you will never amount to anything. And so I walked really quickly, because he was a big man, like 6'10", and like 300 pounds, okay? And I'm a little fresh, or a little sophomore geek at that point. So I'm out of there, quick, coach is mad. Those words have lingered in my life for decades. And isn't it interesting that that coach spoke words to me for 12 months that gave me life and helped me succeed in areas I thought I could never succeed in. And it just took one phrase from him for me to discredit everything he ever said to me and to not recall all those life-giving words and to only replay the words that hurt me, hurt me most. And over the years, I've thought about that moment over and over and over again. 
You see, the words that come out of our mouth, they're not just words. They have the ability to build up our relationships, to bring health to our relationships, and they have the ability to damage and destroy the relationships that we have. We are continuing our series called Relationship Playbook today. And if you're new around here, you picked a great week because what we're going to talk about today impacts each and every relationship that you have in your life. Now, when it comes to our playbook, we are really referring to a system that happens in every relationship that you have. Here's what the system looks like. All of your relationships focus around a commitment. Whether that be you're a child or a parenting relationship, there's a commitment that I'm going to invest in you to help you grow up to be the person you were created to be. I'm going to love and nurture you, right? Or there's a commitment there. If it's your best friend, what do you commit to then? To be your ride or die. I'm going to be there for when times are good and celebrate your birthdays and milestone events. And I'll be there to be the shoulder to cry on when times get hard. And so you have a commitment. Every relationship starts with a commitment. What about your spouse? For better, for worse, till death do us part. Those vows mean something. That was part of your commitment to being married to each other. Now, after the commitment, our relationships go round and round in what we call a cycle, in a system, right? And every time something happens in your relationship, it starts with perspective. When something big and bad happens in your relationship, you have a perspective of what's happening, where your relationship is at, how this person is for you, if your relationship's going to survive. Like you have a perspective and your perspective will inform your response, how you respond to what is happening in that relationship. Are you going to lean in and focus? Because maybe your relationship is in a good spot. And yes, something bad happened. Something tragic happened. Something happened that it shouldn't have. And so you're going to decide, we're going to get through this, babe. We're going to be okay. We're going to be intentional. And we will persevere. And so your response is maybe to lean in. Or maybe your relationship is not in a good place. And then for you, when this happens, it's like, again? Again? I can't believe you did this again. We already went through this once. I already experienced the miracle of forgiveness once. I don't know if I could do it. I think we should just give up and call it quits. Like, what is your response going to be? And your response will 100% impact the words that are going on in your relationship. The words that you speak, the words that you think, the words that you speak to that person you're in a relationship with, and the words you say behind their back. Now, each week of this series, we've been focusing on one of these categories. Week one was perspective, week two was response, and today, again, is all about the words that we speak. And the words that you speak, again, can build health in your relationship, or they could tear it down. And when that happens, depending on what you're saying to each other, what you're thinking about each other, will impact the habits, the routine, how you do life with one another. And so come back next week to hear all about that. Now, it's a circle because, again, this is a cycle of behavior. And no matter how healthy, how good, or how tragic your relationships might be, all of them are operating in these categories. And so what we're hoping during the course of this series is that you learn information, wisdom, and biblical truth that impact how you live the plays in each of these categories in your relationships. And we know, men, that words matter. Okay, here's how I know. My wife did this to me today, and probably your wives did this to you today. Honey, how do I look? How are you going to respond to that question, gentlemen? We know right away the words that come out of your mouth will quickly build up her confidence or put us on shaky ground, right? She will either wear that outfit today on the words that you're going to say, or she will never wear that outfit again because of the words that you say. You will build up her confidence or she will be second guessing herself for the rest of the day, if not days after. What? And it's such an innocent question. The words that we say 
have an impact on the relationships that we have, even when they're just innocent words in passing. And so we have to watch, pay attention to, really think about what is coming out of our mouth. And so today, we're going to heavily lean on the book of James, chapter 3. And we're just going to crawl through a verse that talks all about the speech and how we talk and how what we say has huge consequences that could build up our relationships or destroy our relationships. And so let's pick it up. James chapter 3, verse 2. Indeed, we all make mistakes. Woohoo! So all of us let you know you're in good company because we've all blown it when it comes to our words. Okay, here's what it goes on to say. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect. And we could control also, I'm sorry, and could also control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by the means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder can make a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. There's so much in that verse, and the imagery is captivating. We'll get to the imagery in a moment, but don't let the first line or two pass you by. There was something that is really important there. Again, it said, if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect. We could control ourselves in every other way if we could control our tongues. What does that mean? <laughs> we never stop to think about this, do we? First of all, this verse is telling us that you really don't have the power completely to control every word that comes out of your mouth. It's not an excuse. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't work on it, and we'll get to what we should do about that in a moment. But it also refers to that, hey, your mouth is a sign that things don't go so well in your life, or it can be a sign that things are going really well in your life. Because the best way to understand what Scripture is trying to communicate is to look at other scripture that props it up and helps you understand it. Now, this is not on the screen, but you could look it up later. Luke chapter 6, verse 45 ends with this phrase. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So what comes out of your mouth is what's in your heart. What's in your heart is how you live your life. Again, last week we talked about the rhythms of your life and how important they are. The rhythms won't just help you respond well, but they also help you choose what you fill your heart with. And so if your heart is filled with brokenness, hurt, pain, anger, what's gonna come out of your mouth? Hurt, pain, and anger. And you're going to see here in a moment when we look at the imagery, what comes out of your mouth determines the direction and the destination you are going in life. For example, it talked about a large horse. How many of you have been up and close with a horse? Okay, how many of you have been around horses more than once in your life, but like often, like you had to take care of horses? Okay, for my horse folk in the room, you understand this. Um, before I was a pastor, and I'm saying before I was a pastor, I used to work for a racetrack, okay, before I was a pastor. These horses are massive, okay? They're huge. And when a horse falls down, it hurts the horse. It's not a good thing because they're so heavy. I mean, we're talking six, 800 pounds, huge animal. And they are strong. And the one thing I've learned about a racetrack or about horses is that when they come crashing down, get out of the way. Because it could kill you, it could break your bones, but you'll definitely be pinned until that horse gets moved off of you. Also, I've learned don't stand behind those horses because they are muscular, they are strong, and they could trample and kick you to death like that. They are huge, strong, heavy, muscular creatures. And yet the bit is about this big. And you put that bit in that horse's mouth and you can tell that horse to go wherever you want that horse to go. What does that mean for us in our speech? What you say in your relationships, no matter how big the commitment is, no matter how long you've been in a relationship with that person, no matter what the agreement is, what you say will determine where your relationship is at. Either it's, it experiences health and love and joy 
and you're building it up, or again, it experiences brokenness and destruction, you choose with the words where your relationship is going. And then this verse kind of doubles down on this, and it brings in another image. It talks about a large ship, and a ship is huge, the boats are huge, the vessels are huge, and the rudder is small. The rudder is controlled by the captain. He chooses where the boat goes. But if you look closely, the reason it talks about this is because of our behavior. You see, I have made the mistake where I blame my environment for the way that I act. In that verse, it describes the boat going because of the rudder to the destination that the captain chooses, even though there is strong wind. Now, if the rudder wasn't there, the wind will determine the boat's direction, right? But it's still steered through the rudder. What that means for us is, sure, you might have environment in your life that is unhealthy. I mean, I grew up in a broken home, and I could blame the broken home all I want for the words that come out of my mouth. I am still the captain steering the ship of my relationships. It is still my life and my choice how I want to speak to people who I interact with in life. It's my choice what thoughts I want to think about in my life. Okay? And so what we say, what we think about, it's really up to you to decide. And even though this environment may not be great that you've been brought up in, that you live in, that you have in your home, that you have in your friendships, that's still not an excuse for the way that you talk to people in your life. And this leads me to my first fill-in in our outline here. The words, let's see if we get it up there. The words you choose can alter the course of your relationships. The words that you choose can alter the course of your relationships. Some of us know when we just talk harsh and difficult, but what about us that disguise harsh and difficult talk? Some of you are witty. And I've learned wit takes intelligence. I've tried to be witty. I'm just not smart enough to be witty. I can't think on the spot fast enough. But some of you like to make jokes. And you can bring humor. And don't get me wrong, jokes and humor, they they can be a lot of fun. But when it's at other people's expense, you've really got to decide, are you bringing life to that relationship or are you tearing it down? I uh, grew up at a school, well, let me say it this way. I grew up, again, broken home, single mom, raised me. And while I was at school, mom would take me to a store that doesn't exist anymore. So kids in the room, you're lucky. You don't have to go here, but maybe you do because it's Walmart now instead of Payless. Anyone ever buy shoes from Payless? Do we have Payless in the South? Okay, we had it in Southern California. $20 shoes was what my mama could afford, Okay. And I would wear those shoes, and they would look great. They were comfy. They worked great. I could walk miles in those shoes. They were fine. The only problem with them was how people judged them. And I had a friend named Steve. And when I would go to school, Steve would ridicule me and any other kid that was wearing a shoe that wasn't name brand. Now, Steve was a friend, and he actually liked me. And when he wasn't making fun of me, I liked him. But Steve was smart. He was witty. He was quick on his toes. And he could shred you apart for what you wear on your feet. For example, one of them was the brand Eagle. And we used to have these things called Eagle potato chips. And I had the potato chip shoes. And that was one of the things that he would destroy me on. And I know that sounds so dumb. Like, that's not even a joke. It was a joke in the moment. Hurt my heart. You know, and because he's wittier and smarter, he said it better than I did, okay? So one day I pulled Steve aside. And the best way I could say as a kid in elementary school, you hurt me. Stop it. It hurts my feelings. My mom, this is the best she can afford, $20 shoes. I'm never going to have Nikes or Reeboks or any of those at the school. Maybe when I get a job and I get older, but for now, this is all I got. You are hurting my heart. And Steve responded in a way that I've heard many people respond. I'm only kidding. I'm only joking. Can't you take a joke anymore? Gosh, I just guess people can't take humor. 
and jokes anymore. Let's get back to that boat analogy. Again, I have an image of a big boat that I want to show you. I like going on cruise ships, and before you judge me, like, pastors paid too much, goes on cruise ships. It's cheaper than the average vacation, okay? Let's just go with that, all right? It includes the gas and the destination and the food and the room, and you end up in the Bahamas. It's wonderful. I encourage all of y'all to save up and go on a cruise one day, okay? All right, moving on with the story. The cruise ships are huge. Again, what's that verse say? The rudder is what steers this giant ship, not the winds of the sea. It's not by chance the cruise ship leaves Mobile Harbor and ends up in Nassau down in the Bahamas, okay? It's not the wind that guided it there. It's the propellers that are steering the boat and pushing it forward. Now, what's the most famous cruise ship that has ever existed? The Titanic. When we say the words, can't you take a joke? I guess people can't, can't take humor anymore. That's like the captain of the Titanic who fully knows those rudders are steering the ship. <sighs> can't icebergs get out of the way anymore? I mean, come on, I'm going in this direction. Get out of my way, iceberg. I mean, that's ridiculous, right? And of course he never said that. But it's your choice on the words that are coming out of your mouth where your relationship is going. And sometimes we fall victim to pride and we think, you got to get over it. This is the way that I talk. Well, you will end up with no friendships. You will end up with broken marriages if you don't watch the words that come out of your mouth. Because what you say matters, okay? You are bringing life to your relationships or you are driving the Titanic right into the iceberg. And you don't have to take my advice for it. My heart will go on, okay? <laughs> I practiced that one. Let's jump back into Scripture. James, again, chapter 3, verse 5. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. Among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It's a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. This is not a subtle passage, okay? This is one of those moments in Scripture where the Bible's like, pay attention, folks, because this stuff matters, and it will impact almost all areas of your life, okay? That's what this verse is saying here. It's like, let me be bold and say it in a way that you should comprehend this is not the float on by, all right, this is not like reading the genealogy chapters, all right? We're going through the Bible in one year plan, and I know some of those chapters, it's like, okay, let's get through this. Everybody's related to everybody. It's like Alabama. I get it. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. All right? But this is one of those verses, it's like, pay attention, folks, because this matters. You, you don't have to ask me to pay attention to wildfires. Now, maybe you don't understand a wildfire because here in Alabama, we have this thing called liquid heat in the summer called humidity. This church is on 20 acres. About 10 acres of this church is grass. We don't water this grass in the summer. There's not one sprinkler out there. And yet in two weeks, the grass will grow up to my knees if we're not out there cutting it. It is green and lush because it is liquid heat here. California, we don't know what humidity is. We are dry climate. We're a desert, okay? And when it comes to the summer, we don't water plants. First, because the water bill is more than your power bill here, okay? And second, we're always in a constant state of drought out there. So if you pour water on your grass, the water protesters will come and beat you up. I don't know, okay? And so not only is your vegetation drying out and dying in the summer, but all the nature that's around us on the hillsides dries out in the summertime as well, which means it becomes amazing, perfect kindling. It is so dry in California that there was a water tower in 2018, a water tower with a hook on it, and it was scraping the pole wrong, and it sparked and burned like 30 miles of property because one spark fell and hit the ground. A hook on a pole, for goodness sake, burned miles. I mean, throwing cigarettes out your window will get you beat up because it's like, don't you light our houses on fire. Let me show you how bad fires can look in California. Like when the, there's a fire 
you see the fire, okay? You think this is what hell looks like. This is what Armageddon looks like. The last days looks like a California wildfire. Like that's what I imagine, right? And it won't just stay on the hillside. It comes towards your house. You see, here in Alabama, we're afraid of our houses catching on fire from the inside out, which is a good sermon for another day. But in California, we're afraid of the fire coming towards our house. And in 2008 was probably the worst wildfires that I have ever experienced. In fact, you could see it from space. You have the map one. That gray is not the water. That is smoke coming from Southern California. And it's all over this is like Orange County all the way to Mexico. Mexico's like right here, okay? And it is just on fire. And I remember in 2008 thinking, oh no, North County's on fire. That isn't good. But here's the deal. In the, in the fall, there's this thing called the Santa Ana winds, and it is hot and dry wind that comes in. And it blows like crazy. And if there's a wildfire going on during the Santa Ana winds, we're in trouble. Because that's not like a fire this big. We're talking 100, 200 feet of flames. And the ambers come off the top. And that Santa Ana wind will pick the ambers and it will carry it around. And it's not like, oh, it's going to catch the neighbor's house on fire. 40, 50 miles away, those ambers land and start a whole new fire and start another area. And so what was happening here is one fire led to like dozens of fires all over Southern California. Now, and I get it, as someone who hasn't probably been through a wildfire like that, you're thinking, so what, get in the car and drive away, the problem. What happened in 2008 was unprecedented. And for some reason, the way that the fire embers landed, it boxed us in. It was like closing in on us. And it got to the point that every major highway out of San Diego was on fire. Both sides of the fire freeway were on fire and the flames were crossing the road. You couldn't drive through it without being melted. I mean, I don't think like you could drive hundred miles per hour and just go through the flame real quick. It's not like that. Cause you're talking miles deep of fire. Okay. And so people were evacuating their homes, but at some point we didn't know where to send people. The churches were full. Uh, the chargers were in San Diego back when they were better or well, they were never better, but just back when they were in the place they should have been. And people were evacuated to the, to the stadium there in the parking lot. And they, we were, it was crazy. And then the fire kept moving around. You have to reevacuate. This is a legitimate thought I had. Well, if it gets any closer, I'm going to get in my car. I'm going to drive to the beach and I'll just stand in the water till San Diego finishes burning. <laughs> you know, that's what I saw. I don't know if that's actually possible. I don't know if that's logical, but that was my plan. If it comes after me, I guess I'll go stand in the ocean and hang out with the sharks until this fire is over. Okay. I tell you that story because some of us were blind to the fire in our life. We've lit all our relationships on fire around us and we look at the environment and we look at the condition and we think they've got a problem. What's the common denominator? Is your mouth setting fire to the kindling of relationships in your life? Please evaluate it because scripture says more than likely if your relationships are on fire, it's because of the words that you are saying. Like this stuff matters. And this leads me to my next point for you. The words that I choose, the words that you choose can destroy the health of our relationships. Again, that verse said your mouth, your tongue specifically, is like a lighter starting fires. What does that look like? Well, when you say phrases like this, well, you know what he did? Spark. You know what she said? Spark, spark. You know what you are? You are a spark, spark, spark. You always spark. You never spark, spark, spark. And you're just lighting up your relationships with the words that you are saying. We've got to be careful. Now, if you've ever been burned by a fire, you know it's painful and that it leaves a scar. So do the word fires in your life. The biggest lie ever told is sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Lies. Words hurt. They hurt, not just today, but for decades. And if we're not careful, they will continue to hurt. This isn't the subject for today's message, but really quickly, I want to pause right here and say this. You might have hurt someone with your words, 
But I'm guessing you've been hurt by someone else's words too. And those words still hurt you today. If I could theoretically pick up an amber and it keep on fire in my hand, and it would be hurting me still. It's going to hurt me until I let go of that amber and let my body begin to heal. Some of us are holding on to those words, allowing the painful fire to leave new scars and continually burn and hurt us inside our heart. And the only way to let go of that is the model behavior that Jesus did, which is to practice forgiveness. And I know what you're thinking. I can't forgive them. Do you know what they said to me? Do you know what they did? Forgiveness is not for them. Forgiveness is way more for you than it ever was for them. You're not letting them off the hook. What you are saying is, hey, I know that you blew it, but I'm okay with letting this one go because I don't want to be hurt by that past pain that you caused me. I forgive you and let go of the fire and start to heal. And don't pick back up those ambers. You forgave them. Now, that's a message for another day on forgiveness, but just an FYI, some of us need to let go and forgive the harsh words that have been spoken towards us. Because if we don't, we will believe the lies that either were said to us verbally or that Satan will say to you. Lies like, you're not good enough. You're always going to mess up. You'll never amount to anything. And that's just not true. I've read the Bible enough to know that those are not the plans for God for your life. He adores you. He loves you. And he's got big plans for you. And that's not part of it. You are someone. You are something. God made you in his workmanship. He thinks you're art. More than art, he thinks you're perfect and wonderful and beautifully made. And God doesn't make junk. And he made you. You were not an accident. Everybody was made by God. And you just kind of popped out of the assembly line. No, you were made by God. He thought about you before the world was begun. He was dreaming and thinking about you. And when he sent his son to the cross, he was thinking about you by name. He loves you. You matter to God, okay? So stop believing the lies. Choose to forgive and believe in the truth of the gospel and the scriptures and how much God loves you. All right, let's jump back into this verse. Verse seven, people can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, But no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father. And sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessings and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Pause. Some of us can be here on Sunday and sing, I sing a hallelujah. And we get back in the car. You rotten no good. Come on. We got to be careful about the words coming out of our mouth. It's not just when you're here on Sunday. Take Sunday. Take church. You are the church. Be the church as you go through your relationships midweek. Because this verse is the same mouth that praises our Father curses at the same time. Come back to that in a moment. And by the way, the person that you think little of, it says right here that they're made in the image of God. The image of God. You were made in the image of God, and the person you least likely get along with was made in the image of God also. Okay, moving on. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out fresh water and bitter water? Your water is either clean and drinkable or poisoned, right? Does a fig tree produce olives? Does a grapevine produce figs? No, you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. Now, yes, we need to work on the words coming out of our mouth. And yes, we need to try not to swear and say naughty words. But in this verse, when it talks about cursing, it's not just talking about about bad language. It's talking about a different kind of cursing. One where you're wishing destruction and harm and evil on people. And that's a type of curse too. And we have to be careful what we're saying. Because out of the mouth comes what our heart is full of. And is your heart full of destruction, evil, and harm? 
We need to be working on this. Okay, here's our last point. The words I choose can invite life or death into our relationship. This is the only part in this verse where it pointed out that there's some positive things that you could be doing with your mouth, like praising and blessing people. Your words can be a blessing in someone's life. You have to choose. Are you going to speak words of blessing people and build up your relationships, or are you going to tear down your relationships with the words that you are speaking? Let me close with the story. I feel like in this area, I'm 80% there. You can come at me after church and say all kinds of things, and I'll probably just nod my head and say, well, I'm sorry you feel that way. But there is one person, one people I'm working on that I sometimes get the best of me. My kids. Now, I have spoken a lot of good stuff to my kids. You see, there are some things that my parents never did. Like, they never told me they were proud of me. And I didn't realize how much that matters until I started seeing other parents say, I'm proud of you to their kids. I thought, you know what? I see how that can encourage them. I can see how you're like helping them continue to succeed by supporting them. So I tell my kids all the time, I'm proud of you. I tell them I'm proud of them when they're just doing, hanging out and being them. I tell them I'm proud of them and way to go when they accomplish something great or when they do something that's right. I, I constantly tell my kids I love them uh, all the time. Like when we're cuddling, I'll whisper in one of their ears, I love you so much. Uh, in my house, we're we really uh, have this habit when dad leaves for the day, I turn and I tell everybody I love them, not just in a general I love you, but it's like, Ezra, I love you. Levi, I love you. And I look them in the eye, and Judah, I love you. And I kiss Stephanie and I walk out the door. And my kids have gotten into this habit where now they try to beat me to it. Love you, dad. I love that. I wish I could just close out the prayer, the sermon and go there and be done with it. But I love you too, whoever that was. <laughs> but I'd be lying to you if I haven't blown it big time when it comes to the speech that I have for my kids. They have definitely heard the worst of their dad. And I am so thankful that there's not a tape recorder that can play back the words that I have spoken to my kids at times. But I also, in my heart, cringe at the idea that there actually is one place it's recorded in their mind because words linger they stick around and they hurt for long periods of time and it breaks my heart when I think about some of the terrible things that I have said to my kids I mean there's been times when they do knuckleheaded things and I'm not saying <laughs> that you shouldn't be frustrated with them at times because we have all Parents in a room know kids can be frustrating when they break something, ruin something, do something. Oh, what, you got to be kidding me? You did that intentionally. Dad has raised his voice. I have raised my voice in a way that causes them to cower and cringe. I have, I mean, that's like behavior, like I'm going to come at them with a stick, like a broom handle and beat them. I have never done that. And yet here they are cowering and cringing. What does that mean? Our words hurt so bad that it impacts our physical body as well, that we can be physically scared of the words as well. My guess is I'm not the only parent in the room that has done that. And so the question is, now what? What do we do now that we've blown it with our kids, with our spouse, with our friends, with a family member, with our coworker? Like, now what? Well, here's what I've done. Maybe you have a good idea. Here's what I do where I calm down and it's calm enough that the person lets me back in their presence. I walk in and I apologize to them. I lay my pride aside. Pride will get us messed up, folks. It will cause us to not work on our speech. It will cause us not to apologize. It will cause us not to forgive. We got to get that pride out of our life. God was up to something. He said pride is bad, okay? I walk in there and I apologize I'm so sorry I spoke to you. Daddy should never talk to you that way. It is not right. It doesn't mean what you did was okay, but you don't deserve someone to speak to you in that way. Then I hold their hand and we pray together. Then, in my Jesus time, I pray about it again. 
God, please forgive me for the way I treated your child. Please help me, God, fill my heart with something else other than wrath and anger. Help me, God, to tap into your power, a power greater than myself, because this verse told us we don't have the power to tame the words, but Jesus does, his Holy Spirit does. So my God, help me tap into your power to watch what I am saying. And then I get help. If it's not a reoccurring thing and it's just a one-off, seek wise counsel. This, this church is filled with great biblical people. And if you don't know enough people to know, pat me on the shoulder. I'll point you in the direction of God-fearing men and women that could pour into your life that will help you, pray for you, encourage you, follow up with you to see if it's going well, that will coach you. And if it's major, again, pride, push the pride aside and get professional help. If you have an anger issue that's destroying your life, stop and get professional help. I've had professional help. So if the pastor can have it, you can have it, all right? And then the last thing I do is I make a game plan. What am I going to do? Because I'm human, and I'm going to be mad, and I'm going to be frustrated. What am I going to do next time my blood starts boiling and I want to... That might mean... You walk away, go upstairs to your room, lock the door, and read a book for an hour or two till you can. That might mean you leave the house and go for a walk around the block. If you're not a crazy driver, maybe it's going for a drive, okay? Not if you're a crazy driver. Though. I don't know. You've got to figure out what does it look like for you. To, maybe it's just not talking for an hour until you can pray and be mute and listen to worship music in, in your headphones. I don't know. But come up with a game plan to help you not say poisonous words into your relationship. Again, that verse said that you don't have the power to tame the words. But again, God does. And here's how I think this works. God is always willing to do his part. And here's how the equation works. There is always an our part to play in our relationship with God. And if God does his part, which he will, and if you do your part, which sometimes we do, that equals life transformation. When it comes to your relationships, I want you to experience life transformation. So God's going to do his part. You've got to do your part. What's your part? Coming up with a game plan. When you blow it, apologize. Seeking wise counsel. Always. <laughs> Making a game plan. Connecting with his Holy Spirit and trying to do a little bit better today than you did yesterday. And if you keep at that, you will experience the life transformation. So with all that said, let's go to God and speak words to him so he can pour back into our heart. Heavenly Father.